Seattle. A large city with a bustling economy. But how did it get there? Who founded it? And why is some of the city underground? These questions answered and more in Seattle, an economic and territorial adventure. On November 11th, 1851, a group of pioneers called the Denny Party arrived in the Puget Sound. Seeing the area's potential for housing, and for wood production, they decided to set up a town site. Many of the settlers came from the New York City area, so they called the new town site New York. It was later renamed New York Alki, meaning New York by and by. In early 1852, Arthur Denny, Carson Boren, and William Bell, three members of the Denny party, explored a new area on the eastern shore of Elliott Bay and found that it had a much better harbor than their original town site. By February 15th, they had effectively marked claims in the new area, and the next day they were moving in, with the exception of Charles Terry and John Lowe, who stayed in the first town site. The new village was first called Duomps until early 1853, when a new resident and Seattle's first merchant, Dr. David S. Maynard, suggested to be named Seattle, after the native Duwamish chief, Seelth. Seelth was a respected and prominent leader in his time, as he had greatly boosted the tribe's accommodation with the white people by establishing a friendship with Maynard and by giving an inspiring speech in regards to native lands. He made some important um, kind of assessments of the Indian situation at the time. He said, we'll never be gone, or we'll always be here. And he made kind of the famous comment, the ashes of our ancestors are part of the soil that is beneath your feet right now. And the river that you are standing in was this same river that our ancestors drank out of. And the, uh, the, the blood of our ancestors runs through that wind river, so we are all connected. It was kind of his, his thing. Sometime later, in 1853, a new resident named Henry Yesler came to town with the materials to build a large sawmill. The sawmill was built at the foot of what is now Yesler Way, and it served as the base economic resource for the small town of Seattle for a very long time. By 1869, Seattle had been added to the territorial legislature. At the time, there were over 2,000 residents. This was a big surprise, as the town had started out so small and now has over 2,000 people. On June 6, 1889, a large fire completely demolished most of the shops and businesses in downtown Seattle. Seattle responded to this in two different ways. First, they decided that all of the new buildings had to be made out of brick or stone. And second, over the next several years, they would regrade the streets one story higher. Now this raised a big problem for the business people of Seattle. How could they rebuild their businesses if the streets would get suddenly taller some years later? They solved this problem as follows. The new buildings would have two doors, one on the first floor and another on the second floor, where the streets would be regraded to. The fire also encouraged Seattle to make many more great improvements like making fire departments not volunteer-based, improving and reconstructing wharves, and creating completely municipal waterworks. In 1897, gold was discovered near the Klondike River in the Yukon, and, naturally, many people wanted to go there and try to collect some. Surprisingly, Seattle was the closest American city to the river at the time, so it became a very popular place for people wanting to try their luck in the Klondike. Many Seattle businesses became centered around mining tools for those people, and, as a result, Seattle's economy rose exponentially. All of these actions demonstrated the resourcefulness and persistence that characterized Seattle's early colonists, 
which allowed them to transform an essential swamp into a highly prosperous and industrial city. Things like connecting to transcontinental railroads, building many ships for World War I, sponsoring world fairs, advertising outbursts, and many other major events in Seattle history helped it become what it is today. Seattle has always exhibited a spirit of enthusiasm and perseverance, and it has continued to maintain that trend as it builds new buildings, businesses, and parks. Seattle enthusiasts have honored the people that contributed to Seattle by building museums, memorials, and monuments. One example of this is a sculptured bust built in West Seattle of Chief Seaalf, with famous Duwamish sayings written on the posters behind it an indication of the importance of early encounters with native citizens to Seattle and Washington history. As Seattle continues to grow, we reflect on what it took to build this wonderful city and try to maintain its legacy within the community. Part 2. Seattle's Founding Fathers Arthur A. Denny was the alleged leader of the Denny Party at the time they landed in the Puget Sound. He was a very religious man, yet, in the early days of Seattle, he despised the Indians and treated them poorly because of it. He disliked admitting when he was wrong, even for little things. His mindset was, if he said something and somebody else didn't agree with him, then the other person was wrong. Arthur had two older brothers and one younger brother. The older brothers didn't go to Puget Sound with him, but the younger one, David Denny, did. David Denny was calm, docile, and easygoing. Unlike his brother, David was very pleasant, and he liked the new land for his beauty, not for its economic value. These two people helped Seattle from the very beginning, Arthur with his economic mindset, and David with his sentimental understanding to the rest of the population of Seattle. Another mentionable person from Seattle history is Dr. David S. Maynard, sometimes referred to as Doc Maynard, or The Doc. Maynard was a usually completely drunk man who had come to Seattle to set up a salmon salting business downtown. Doc Maynard later sided with Arthur to run Seattle. On Maynard's half of Seattle, he tended to give away land to businesses for a very little price, and he didn't care what the businesses were doing so long as they made money. This resulted in a very bad but profitable side of town with black markets, large alcoholic bars, and illegal trade centers. Despite these things, Doc Maynard was a very significant figure in Seattle history. And last but not least, Chief Seal. Seal was a very young man when he earned his reputation as both a warrior and a leader because of the many ambushes he had led as a young adult. Although the title of chief was hereditary, it was obvious Seelf would become a great leader. His tribe, the Duwamish, lived in the area that is now Seattle, and had many encounters with the founders of Seattle, especially David Maynard, whose shops he was a regular at. In March of 1854, he gave a speech to a great number of people just outside Seattle in regards to native lands. These three people were the most significant figures in the development of the Seattle area, and their legacies live on as Seattle is getting more and more developed. Thank you, and good night.